Go ahead and start with our Beefmaster 101 Back to the Basic Seminars. Uh, we're excited to have Dr. Jason Clear with Texas A&M University here to, to visit with us this morning. Dr. Clear is an associate professor at Texas A&M University and a Texas A&M AgriLife Extension beef cattle specialist. He works to coordinate statewide beef cattle extension efforts as well as conducting regional educational programs. This morning we've asked Dr. Clear <coughs> to cover the basics of cattle evaluation, including structure, confirmation, balance, and growth. Help me welcome Dr. Jason Clear. Oh, well, thank you guys, and uh, certainly a pleasure to be here and, and uh, the opportunity to spend the morning or at least an hour with you guys uh, visiting with you about cattle selection, and, and then also be back tomorrow uh, for the sale and, and uh, the, the presentation of some of the donated genetics that the uh, Beefmaster breeders across the U.S. have, have given to the uh, Beef Center and helping us with that. I'll just tell you, since we kind of got a collective audience, it's, it's exciting to uh, to see the uh, outpouring of support from Beefmaster breeders and, and we've already got some uh, donations and done some flushing already and exciting to see those heifers that have been donated and, and additional genetics that are that'll be coming uh, soon so we appreciate it from uh, the Department of Animal Science at Texas A&M we we look forward to being a partner with the uh, Beefmaster breeders as we move to the future of the uh, Beef Center and, and some of the things that are going on from a teaching, research, and extension there at Texas A&M. So this morning, we're going to talk to you a little bit more on the visual cattle selection and evaluating cattle, uh, essentially the term on the hoof. Uh, now, I enjoy judging cattle. I've judged a lot of y'all's cattle. Uh, my two boys, I was raised up in the show business and, and evaluating cattle and showing cattle. And my two boys uh, get to uh, show cattle, both steers and heifers for 4-H uh, projects. And uh, we just wrapped up a couple of week run at State Fair of Texas. And, and uh, a few years ago, we even had a, I stumbled upon a beef master female that I liked a bunch. And, uh, uh, she was real successful and and did well for the boys went in some some major shows and uh, and so I enjoy selecting cattle and, and even more importantly when I'm selecting cattle for commercial producers uh, whether it's buying bulls to be put out on a set of commercial cows or just sorting through commercial females uh, you know those are the cattle I probably enjoy sorting more than actually standing in a, in a show ring uh, because there's less uh, darts and bullets flying when you're uh, out in the pasture sorting cattle versus a show ring. The reason I bring this up is because, you know, visual selection is, is one of the tools that we have uh, in the toolbox. And that's, uh, uh, years ago I had a breeder tell me when, when, we're, when I was young and, and working on my PhD, you know, we got a lot of tools that we can work with in the cattle business. And if you think about the history of cattle selection and when we, we began sorting cattle, yeah, it was basically done off a of visual you know at, at the time hundreds of years ago uh, individuals began to, to sort cattle based on their particular needs in the region of the world uh, and really and truly that's that's how we ended up with breeds of cattle uh, uh, that were developed around the world whether it be a boss indicus or the Hereford or shorthorn or Angus whatever it may be depending on the needs of those producers in those areas whether it be draft or milk, whether it be hot climate, cold climate, uh, whatever the needs were, that's how those breeds were developed and began the selection process. And then as over time, we began to uh, become more specialized in the way we raise these cattle. We shifted more into the beef side of the business. Uh, and in the U.S., we, we imported uh, virtually all the breeds that we have today. And then fortunately, as we, we began to uh, progress and take advantage of Ball Syndicus genetics here in the southern U.S., uh, we gained, began the development of our American breeds and the Beefmaster breed. And so we began to select those cattle and we developed our breeds uh, that we have here. And then we began to select those visually on, you know, confirmation and characteristics. And that changes over time as well uh, with that. But so we've always had the visual selection. And then we figured out, you know, we're kind of in the, the beef business, the pounds business. Uh, 
Jesus. And so, you know, weight's important to us. And so we began collecting data on weights and measures, uh, hip height and cattle, weighing calves at birth, weighing calves at weaning, getting yearling weights, uh, you know, collecting all the actual data points on those cattle. And then we evolved and, and took it a step further and we figured out, well, we can run some statistical analysis on that data that we have and begin to get some more accurate genetic predictions uh, of that and take out some variation. And that's what Lance uh, is going to talk to you all about here in just a minute when he gets into EPDs and the value of EPDs. And so we've taken it a step further and when we're looking at the EPDs uh, and taking those individual records and, 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 and taking essentially a lot of the variation out because everybody doesn't raise them the same across the United United States. And so those EPDs have become just such a valuable tool for us uh, and helping us from a genetic prediction and, and helping us make decisions based off of selection. And then we get into, we've, we've had ultrasound data for years now. And we had the ability of taking that ultrasound scan data and incorporating it back into the database, into the EPDs. The exciting thing is, and I hopefully that uh, most of you got to sit in on the genomics discussion that was yesterday by Neogen, uh, this is where it really becomes exciting. Uh, as you know, you, you guys, some of you older breeders in here remember when we first had the genomics data and we had the three stars and four stars and all that good stuff and it was exciting. You know, how much did it mean? You know, I don't know. I mean, it was probably more marketing than anything. But now we can take that genomics data and, and you can begin to plug it into the database, the EPDs. And, you know, if you look at some of these breed associations that, that have been really aggressive in the genomics data, the exciting thing is you can take virgin bulls and have accuracies of mature bulls with a lot of progeny on them. And so you can begin to select some of those virgin bulls and that's, that's good from a purebred producer if, if they're trying to select new sires, but even more importantly when you think about if you move into uh, commercial producers who's really our bread and butter when we think about the seed stock industry. It, it's being able to sell bulls and females. And, uh, and so again, we take that genomics data and, uh, data and that stepped it up a, a notch there as we, we begin to, to look at that and process that data uh, with it. And so, again, there's a lot of tools that we do have and when we're thinking about the data that we have, again, you know, for me, as, as I'm s selecting cattle, uh, you know, the process that I go through is, if I'm going out and I'm trying to select a, a set of commercial bulls for a producer, one, I get what, what I'm looking for, whether I'm looking for a terminal cross, uh, if I'm emphasizing weaning weights, if they're going on heifers, you got to set your parameters on what you're doing. But then, so, you know, I figure out, figure out what my parameters are, and then I look at the data first, all right? I never look at live cattle first. And the reason is because I'm weak, all right? And I'm a sucker for a good-looking animal. We all are. And if we go and sort through the cattle first and we see the best one uh, there, then we begin to second-guess ourselves and say, well, you know, I, yeah, that date is okay. He's bottom 1% for birth weight, and I'm putting him on first calf heifers. He'll probably be all right, all right? So I, I get my sort off the data first. Uh, and, and then I move into the visual selection process and the evaluation of that uh, after that. And that's, again, that's, that's kind of my process when we're looking at it as, as we go with it. But you've got to utilize all the available tools that we have. And there's just a lot of exciting things from a data management standpoint. Uh, and I think as, as you look at producers, uh, purebred breeders, I mean, you've got to look at those things. Uh, again, do certain commercial producers, all they look at is the visual? Sure, all right? But if you're really targeting and trying to market your bulls 
to those aggressive producers, either the seed stock side or those commercial producers that are in it for the business, um, the data is going to be so important. Um, and, and you've got to look at it. So again, use their, all the tools that you have as we begin to look at it. When we think of visual evaluation, um, you know, the, the look of the animal, there's a lot of parts and pieces to these cattle. Uh, and I'll tell you, as producers and, and as, you know, people that evaluate cattle or sort cattle for commercial heifer programs or the show ring, whatever it may be, you know, we all have our favoritisms, okay, uh, that we look at. And, and again, but in general, you know, hopefully we all have, you know, similar goals that we're trying to produce and, and do. Sometimes uh, some individuals maybe want to get on the extreme uh, versus, but uh, me, I'm probably more kind of the middle of the road because sometimes the extremes get us in trouble uh, in this business that we're in. And so when we start off uh, in selection, I, I always look at structure first, um, you know, and, and I tell this to producers, but also kids that we're talking about uh, selecting 4-H or FFA projects, start at the ground up, you know, that's the way I was taught, uh, and, and looking at the structure of these cattle is so important because if, if you, you know, you start looking at everything else, and you come back to structure, you begin to second guess yourself, and you begin to justify whether or not uh, that animal is 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 structurally sound. You say, well, you know, he's huge topped, you know, a lot of muscle, beautifully balanced animal, but he's got three legs. But I believe he can breed cattle on three legs. All right, and and we begin to start to to justify these things, and so as we look at structural correctness, we've got to start at the ground up and start at the foot and work our way up and and this is just some old pictures and diagrams that uh, really kind of I want to set the basis as we get into some video here in just a minute as we look at the the structure and, and what I want you to do is remember the skeleton because that's that's what it's about is the skeleton of these animals and so you can see this is kind of the, the correct structure now when we look at it in the front I'm gonna draw some lines on this live heifer in a minute but if we look at it you can take from the, the scapula here the top of the blades down to the point of that shoulder all the way back to their elbow right here and that's about a 90 degree angle all right and you can see that knee joint sets back the foot sets in front of it same thing in behind we look at it we see our pelvis now if you listen to the show ring jargon they'll, they'll you'll hear a judge say well she's really level in her top line she's really level from hooks to pins are structurally sound cattle level from hooks to pins no, they're not. They're, they're going to have a little bit of set from their hook bones to their pin bones, okay? If those pin bones are actually level and pushed up, uh, a lot of times those cattle will be a little bit too straight out of that hind leg, as you can see in this picture up here. You can see that pelvis is a little, little leveler, and you can see the angulation. We've lost those angles to that hind leg there. On the flip side... If you do get one that slopes from hooks to pins, as you can see in this particular animal, they've got too much angulation and they would what, we'd be, we, what we would consider being sickle hocked. And a lot of times those cattle over time will begin to break down in their pasterns and the back of their heels will wear. So what you'll find out is if you see these cattle that <coughs> maybe deviate from what is a desirable skeleton uh, as they grow and mature we begin to see the skeletal system start to break down all right now not enough angles all right to the skeleton they're going to break down faster all right if you got too much angle you're going to break down eventually. You're probably not going to live as long as you've got one that does have the correct angulation uh, in them. So just kind of keep, a, keep this uh, skeleton in mind uh, as we look at it here. And I want to show you some videos here. Well, first, I want to show you this here. Something that's also important when we talk about the foot of cattle is when we, when we think about the hoof and foot itself, um, sometimes we get into some cattle that are really small footed um, and, and typically those smaller footed cattle or maybe a little smaller jointed bones, 
But then also, typically those cattle, will, their feet will wear a little faster. Uh, then you've got one that's got a big foot on him uh, and it got a good surface to it. Uh, the other thing is you want to look at those cattle is look at how much heel that they have. All right, if you look at them. And so when we're talking about heel, we're talking about here. And sometimes you'll see these cattle that just don't have much heel on them. And what will happen over time is this, this back portion will wear very irregular. And what, we'll see, what you'll see is the toe will grow out faster. And then the problem, just as that animal matures and ages, you become, uh, it becomes magnified with that. Again, can we fix it with hoof trimming? Sure we can, but is that practical? No, it's not, all right? And so uh, you've, you've got to think about those things. And so the hoof, uh, the heel of it is extremely important in making sure that we've got some cattle, that we breed some foot on them, uh, and the heel on them as well. Um, the one thing, other thing too, is that uh, in the business we're in today, we, we tend to push bulls. And when I mean push them, I mean feed them hard as we're developing bulls and, and to a lesser extent females. Uh, and when we develop these bulls, we're trying to put the weight and condition on them from a growth because we're looking at gain test. But we're also trying to put the marbling in them as well from an ultrasound carcass perspective. And also, I hate to say it, but fat does sell when it comes to bulls. Unfortunately, I think we're maybe seeing a little bit of change in that. Uh, but the reality is if you've got a bull that's in good condition, what we term working condition, and then you got one that's got a lot of grease on him, uh, somebody's going to buy the one with grease, even though they say they don't like fat bulls, all right? And I think when you get that, uh, where we push these bulls too much, especially on these high grain diets, we can get into some acidosis, and then several months after we see an incidence of acidosis, uh, digestive upset in those cattle, then we begin to see some founder issues and foot issues. And so one of the things that I, that I do look at is, is that actual foot in the hoof wall and try to see it uh, with that. Now, again, that can be some challenges if some cattle are in some muddy condition, but, but for me, that's important because if I see any irregularities in that hoof wall or something strange about that foot or the way that foot's growing, that hoof's growing, that's a red flag that something maybe happened uh, to that bull and we could see some problems down the road with that. The other thing is that uh, we see sometimes in these ball syndicus cattle, a curled toe uh, in there and uh, you know you'll see that genetically in some of these cattle that'll pass it on so we well, again we want to try to avoid those types of things the other thing is that as we look at them is the pastern all right, and as you can see here, uh, when, we're, when we're looking at the pasterns there, you can see these cattle are pretty weak pasterned here when we look at them. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is, again, some of these defects go hand in hand. If we see one that's weak pasturing, a lot of times they'll have a small heel on them as well. And they just begin to wear over time irregular uh, with that. And so on flip side, if we look at uh, the opposite end of the spectrum, is we look at a pasturing here, we can see the angle to that foot but here, we're beginning to see too steep of pasterns there. And so we want to definitely avoid uh, that characteristic as well. All right, so I want to show you some video here. We shot this earlier in the week. Here, um, as you can see, this is a little beef master heifer that uh, uh, we've got uh, donated there at the beef center from the Emmons family there. Um, and you'll notice this female; she's, uh, uh, I think, this is Mr. Emmons. This uh, January, February. What was she? January baby. Uh, and uh, you know, she's not fat today. And to be honest with you, we don't necessarily want her fat. We've got this heifer we're just developing on her at the beef center uh, as well, um, growing her out well. But uh, one of the things that uh, you'll always recognize is that, that cattle don't have to be fat to be good looking. All right. If you've got some cattle that have got the bones, they've got the muscle, uh, they're going to stand out at you. And so as you look at this particular heifer here, and, and as I begin to, to draw on her, you can see I drew the, uh, the hook bones. 
and the pin bone's there, all right, and she's kind of standing in a little bit of a hole, and I've got her foot set, but, but she's got a little bit of drop there to her pelvis. Uh, oftentimes, you see the judges, when they say, okay, she's flat and level in her hip design, they're talking a lot about their, their tail head, probably more than anything there, uh, as we, we just studied that. Then as we fast forward just a little bit, So we can see kind of the way the pelvis lays in on that heifer. And again, imagine that skeletal system as we looked at her uh, and as we begin to connect the dots. Now I went to Anderson, Texas High School, all right? There was 14 people in my class. Art class was not a priority, guys. It's quite obvious in my drawing techniques. But if, but if you look at this heifer here and you study their skeletal design, does it look about like that picture that we saw with the correct angulation? She's got enough angulation to her hind leg. She's got some set to her pasterns. If I put that stick, that sword and stick at the point of her toe, you can see those angles there uh, with her. Uh, and so ideally from the, the, the hind leg, that's important. We also want to look at on those hind legs as you look at them from behind, look for any swelling in those joints or anything, especially when we're looking at bulls. Um, you know, we, we want to avoid any kind of joint problems. Uh, but then also as we look at them from behind, those hind feet ought to be sitting straight forward, all right, as they're moving. If you see them where they, they hock in and those toes point out, Oftentimes, that's associated with them being sickle hocked as well, too much angulation uh, with them. If they're bow legged, um, a lot of times you'll see that. That same defect that you'll see is if they're too straight sometimes on those hind legs. So it all begins to, to work together there uh, with that. And so again, those toes ought to be straightforward. Uh, one thing we're going to do at the end of this video is show you a little bit on, on how this animal moves uh, around because that's something that's extremely important as we set them in motion as well. But you can see that heifer's got really, uh, from an angle standpoint, I really appreciate the leg and the foot. Uh, if you studied the foot of this particular female, she's got a big foot on her. She's got adequate heel to her as well. And she's really big bone too. You're not excessively, but, but she's got some substance of bone to her as well, which is, is an indicator of growth and performance too, uh, along with that. So then we began to move to the, the front end uh, of this particular heifer. And again, thinking about that skeleton, as I draw a dot at the, the top of the blades, the point of that shoulder, and then we come back to that elbow pocket, and we begin to connect those dots. You can see here. Um, and, and what you'll see is, if we see that line there, it's going to end up being about a 90 degree angle there and you can see the skeletal. Uh, now, as you're selecting cattle for structural correctness out of that front end, if you just always remember that, that triangle there, and then you'll be able to tell whether or not what, what's going to happen on that animal from a skeletal uh, correctness standpoint. If this animal's shoulder is pushed back into her body, maybe in line with that sorting stick, that angle is going to be a lot greater and more open. And when we see those cattle, I'll show you in a picture in a minute, is that those cattle with that angle that, that big, they're going to be straight in their front end design. And the reason we call them straight is because the skeleton begins to line up. Um, that, that joint is pushed back. Uh, with that. Now you'll see on this heifer, if we put that sort and stick at her toe, her knee comes down and it gradually sets behind that toe, and you can see there's a subtle, subtle uh, set and give to that front knee in that particular heifer. If that angle, that shoulder's pushed back, and that angle is greater than 90 degrees, what you will begin to see is the pasterns will be too straight, the knee will be in line with the toe, and it'll be somewhat in line with the point of that shoulder. Okay, and, and those cattle, we would say, would be too straight out of their front end. If I've got an animal at this age that is a little straight, 
What's going to happen when she's three times this weight? She's going to be a lot straight, all right? And she's, as we put weight on those animals, we begin to magnify the skeletal problems, okay? And what you will see on these cattle that are too straight out of their shoulder, uh, and we begin to see that the joints line up and the knee is setting directly over that foot, uh, what you will find is those cattle will, will stand there, and, and again, when they're standing, sometimes they'll shift that front knee forward. Now, what are they trying to do? That's the pressure, just like me. I'm not standing up here stiff-legged the whole time because my, my joints, the pressure pushing down. In cattle, that angle is so important to, to the design of those animals. As we begin to deviate that, you will begin to have some structural problems, and they'll pass it on. And when you get into to cattle that are too straight, uh, and you begin incorporating some of those genetics in the herd, one, longevity is going to affect, be affected, but it's a challenge sometimes to, to get that mess out of there. Uh, uh, and then what you will see a lot of times those cattle as you begin to add the performance and you try to feed those cattle They may be structurally sound and what you think is somewhat sound But as you begin to grow and mature and develop those cattle uh, We see this in the show steer world where you're kind of dealing with uh, extremes and freaks there uh, and uh, you know, you, you think, oh, that calf's, you know, pretty sound, everything's okay. And then all of a sudden you get a swollen hock. Uh, or you get those cattle that maybe start to get a little straight. And so as you put the performance on these cattle, some of these defects will begin to, to magnify there uh, as well. And so, again, when we're thinking about structure, those, that's, that's an important piece of the puzzle is making sure on both ends of that skeleton we've got that correct angulation uh, as we see those cattle there. The other thing, too, that as we study cattle, sometimes you hear this term, uh, you know, I like to... I like that back that is just like a jet, you know, our airplane runway, you know, flat as can be. Um, if you study really good functional sound cattle, is their back perfectly flat? No, there's a slight give to it. And if you'll study them when they walk, when they have a little bit of give to their spine, they're going to have more flexibility in their spine. And they're going to move a lot easier. And you'll see that transition all the way down. If you'll watch cattle that are sound, they, their heads and necks don't move very much. They just kind of lumber around like, hey, I'm, you know, it's easy. But if you get one that is, that is really flat in their back or even up in their spine a little bit, their range of movement is going to be a little less. Uh, and what you'll see is there are probably some challenges as you go down into the skeleton. And when you get one that's too straight on both ends, not enough angulation, you'll see those cattle will hump up in their back and their spot there uh, with that. So I like to see one that's got a little bit of give to that spine on those cattle. I think that's extremely important uh, from a design standpoint is you got to be able to see them move. And so uh, my crude drawing there, we look at this particular female, you can see that when that front foot picks up, that back foot pretty much sets down right where it was. This heifer's got a lot of softness to her pastern. Uh, she gets out and she moves really easy. You can see her... You can see her taking those steps, those, those pasterns set in there. She's really easy moving uh, in her design. Um, again, that functionality is, is really, really important uh, when we're thinking about the selection of those cattle. So let me go back to here. We'll show you a few defects. <clears throat> So here's an example, and, and this is an old full blood Simmental, but as you can see, if you'll study this, this particular animal and the straightness of it, uh, let's see how that shoulder's pushed back into its body. If we look at this angle, it's going to be greater than 90 degrees. And that defect up here transitions all the way down. Look at the pasterns on this bull. There's, there's no angle to his pasterns. His knee is actually setting right over the top of his, his 
uh, toe of his foot there. And that's just a classic example of one that's, that's entirely too straight. And as if you look at it in this picture a little closer, you can see on that right foot over there, that knee's pushing forward. And, and he's just trying to release some pressure in that. So, again, those are things that you definitely want to av uh, avoid. Because you got to remember, I mean, these cattle that, uh, uh, especially on the bull side, as we turn bulls out with cows, they got to make, make a uh, move many a mile. But then also, we got to think about just the pressure off the hind legs as they jump up, mount a cow, and as they come back down on the ground uh, after they mounted a cow. That's so important. Uh, and if you get some bulls that that are just not sound and we get into some pain in those bulls they're just not going to be as aggressive breeders uh, as well uh, with that and so some things to uh, consider there the other thing is too as we we set these cattle in motion you know that heifer I said she when she picked her front foot up her back foot hit it all right, right where that one picked up at. If you see cattle that are maybe too much angle, sickle hocked, they're going to overstep that foot. And then if you see cattle that are uh, not enough angle, too straight, like this particular bull, he's probably going to take a very short step, all right, because he just does not have the range of motion. Uh, and so it takes him a lot more steps to cover as much ground. Just like my, my little one when he was just a few years old, uh, when he'd walk next to me, I'm, I take big steps and I'm always on a mission. And he'd take about a thousand steps to my two steps. And, uh, and it's the same thing on these bulls. It, you know, they're going to have to make more steps. They're going to wear out faster uh, because of those things. And so, again, think about that. And we'll show you some pictures of some videos. Here's one that uh, uh, would we consider would be a sickle hock uh, design. Oftentimes, these cattle that are sickle hocked, again, their pin bones are going to be set much lower than their hook bones. And they're going to be kind of rounded off in their hip design. There's one that's too straight. And if you look at the hock on this particular bull, uh, and I, you know, there's a lot of bulls out there that look like this. But if you look at the hock on that bull, it almost looks like it's fused together. Okay, one piece. And if you'll study it even closer, if we could see the both sides of it, it's probably got some swelling and things in there. Okay. Now, is it to say that that bull won't go on, go on to live 12 years? Uh, I mean, I've seen straight cattle that I would have culled, and, and they, they breed. But nine times out of ten, they're not. And, and you're going to have some problems with those cattle. Uh, and, you know, potentially problems with those progeny, too. Because we've got to realize that uh, those ca the calves out of these things got to make cows, or they're going to go to the feed yard. And, and, and its soundness is extremely important in there as well. Here's one that uh, is cow hocked. Again, a lot of times when you see cattle that are sickle hocked, they'll also be cow hocked uh, and those toes pointing out. Uh, there's a bow legged one. You, you certainly want to avoid uh, those particular defects. Um, again, putting all the pieces together is extremely important. On the front legs, uh, as we study those feet, you know, we talked about the angle from the side, but on their front feet, you know, I hear this, man, this, this particular uh, heifers, uh, all four feet point directly straight forward. All right. Now the back ones are supposed to point forward. Are the front ones supposed to point directly straight forward? No. Uh, to me, if I see one, a, a female or a bull, and its front feet are pointing straight forward, a lot of times <coughs> that's a red flag that that thing may be a little bit straight out of its front end. And so if you study cattle, uh, ones that are sound in their design, meaning they, they get out and move, they're going to tow just a little bit out, just a little bit. Not, you know, one's going one way and one's going the other, but they're not going to be perfectly straightforward. And if you watch those cattle walk, those that just have just a slight toe out, okay, <coughs> that is natural, when they hit the ground, that foot's going to turn. Okay, and they're going to give some give to it. <coughs> Sorry, I've been battling a cold here. Um, <coughs> so again, structural is, is extremely important. All right. <coughs> 
This is uh, Laddie Ellis's car right here. All right, he 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 has problems all the time. I don't know how he fits in that thing for one thing. Um, I'd have a hard time in there, but uh, you know, <coughs> when we think about a, a bull or a female, you got to have a good set of wheels. All right, and. Um, and really and truly, when we think about Beefmaster cattle, uh, the advantage that we have to this particular breed is that these cattle, <clears throat> we can put them in improved pastures where we may be looking at a cow to five or six acres, but we can also put them on a section. And those cattle were, are just really functional in their design and, and just the nature of the breed. But if they don't have a good set of feet and legs, uh, you're out on both ends of it. And so <clears throat> structure is really, really important. Growth rate. <coughs> and um, uh, this is actually some pictures of Steve Hammock. Uh, Dr. Hammock's our retired specialist out of Stephenville, but he works part-time for us, and he's kind of our historian because uh, he's pretty old. Uh, but uh, he, he likes to, to pull up history, and <clears throat> he, he pulled these, this slide together. I updated that last picture there over the last day or so, but if you'll look at it, when we think about cattle uh, and how they've changed over time, oftentimes we think about cattle the way they used to be, we think about the fat stock show era back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, all right? But if you go back before that time, cattle were big. And you think about it, you know, cattle, <clears throat> before we really intent and started uh, directing them towards beef production exclusively, they were used for draft purposes. And so, you know, I don't know how much draft you'd get out of this little dude, all right? But you ca those cattle had size and frame and growth to them. And these guys in this picture up here, they're not little. Those are just big cattle, all right? So we went through a transition of time. Uh, we went big to small <clears throat> in the 80s. I don't know what we were thinking about in the 80s. Uh, I wasn't. This was y'all, okay? But, uh, <clears throat> you know... Uh, I, that's why I skipped that era there. But if you look at it, you know, cattle got big. We, we saw the influx of those continental cattle, and essentially we bred them for height. And those cattle were big. They had legs under them, all right? Um, and, and now as you study them, uh, cattle have moderated their size. But what has happened to carcass weights? They've gone up. One, we're feeding cattle longer. But two, uh, you know, frame size is, is down, but pounds are up, so what do we do to those cattle? We made them wider, all right? Deeper bodied, wider. We, we took some of the feet and legs off. And uh, this is a, a Beefmaster heifer, just a prime example. And I, uh, this heifer was the <coughs> reserve supreme heifer at Houston this year uh, for the Shear family. But if you look at that female, there's a lot of product in that female. Um, and, and again, when we're thinking about pounds, things have changed over time. And so uh, growth rate is important in how we've changed the breed. Now, can it be a double-edged sword for the Beefmaster people, breeders? Sure it can, all right? I mean, we also know that as we put these cattle in different environments, if we make them too big, too heavy, uh, maintenance requirements go up. And when we get into some of these extensive conditions, that's a challenge there. So we always got to remember, you know, to me, the foundation of the Beefmaster program is it's, it's a maternal breed. Uh, and that's what you hang your hat on. Now, do we have to have product? Sure we do. Okay. Uh, and, and we've got to look at that. But don't, don't forget when we think about growth rate that you've got to have adequate, but you do have to balance it. I was on the phone yesterday with a gentleman, <clears throat> and he uses, he's up in uh, north of Abilene, so he's got predominantly Angus-based uh, uh, commercial cow-calf operation. And uh, he just had a closeout on a set of steers, and uh, those steers uh, averaged <clears throat> just under 1,400 pounds, uh, the kill weight on them. Uh, but he had half of them were yield grade fours, and about 5% were yield grade fives. And he says, what's going on here? And I said, well... And his ribeye area averaged about 13 inches. So if you think about a 1,400-pound steer 
average muscle steer ought to have about a 14 and a half inch rib eye area. And so when we think about that, he says, well, did they just feed them too long? And I said, yeah, they probably did feed them too long. I said, but uh, it, it also, I think you got a few challenges in your world as well that you may need to start thinking about a little bit and breeding just a shot more muscle in those cattle to give you a little more pounds in them. But it's a double-edged sword uh, because he's in an area of the state that uh, they very they have very sporadic rainfall so you got to be careful with those things and growth rate and muscle and those factors are extremely important you know the biggest thing on growth rate yeah we can look at cattle and, and we can say yeah she's got a lot of growth or so on but for me on the growth rate I'm gonna go and, and I'm gonna look into what Lance is fixing to talk about and look at the data on those cattle because that's really going to give us a good estimate of, of what we think the production is going to be on those cattle and the performance of them. <clears throat> One thing that I always throw up to uh, my students is a quality heavy dead calf worth more than a lighter live calf. All right. I always got to remember that when we're thinking about growth rate and, and even in selecting muscle in these cattle. Uh, you know, again, we've got to think functionality in these cattle and, and uh, making sure that, that they, they can calve out and produce us a live calf. And then we think about pounds after that. Muscling is, is something, again, it, it, it can be a double-edged sword for, uh, for this particular breed. I think in the last 15 years, the uh, beef master breed as a whole, uh, one of the challenges they probably had was not enough muscle, all right? And you guys have done a great job of, of, of putting some muscle in these cattle, and, uh, and, and I think it's, you know, it shows with the marketability of these to the commercial cowman. But at the same time, I think you got to be be careful and, and, and figure out what what market you're going to. And to me, the, the foundation of the Beefmaster breed is still a maternal market. And we can't put too much muscle in these cattle where we're trying to be a terminal cross. Uh, you got to hang your hat on what, what you're good at. And that's, that's being a, just a tremendous cow for the South, but also having some productivity from the feeder calves as well that are the result of those matings. And so when we think of muscling, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> your ultrasound measurements are going to be very very accurate. I mean, if you look at the reliability of ultrasound and the correlation of it to actual ribeye area, it, it's really highly correlated. So, you know, I tell all commercial producers, you know, the one, you know, carcass measurement, if you're not selling calves all based off a of carcass measurement, if you're taking your calves to the sale barn, you can still look at ribeye data, look at that EPD and the actual data, because it's going to give you an indication of the muscling of that animal, all right, and, and the indication of the muscling of the progeny out of that animal as well. So ultrasound measurements really give us a, a, a good um, um, objective measurement versus a subjective one, uh, whereas we're looking at them on the hoof. Not to say that we can't look at muscle, all right, <clears throat> and so uh, as we're looking at, that's Collins beef measurement on the top left there you know he, he represents the association well you know um, he, he says he doesn't want to raise any good ones because he's going to compete with all of his his breeders so he, he's doing a good job there um, but you can see muscle the difference you know again when we're thinking about muscling in cattle uh, lighter muscled cattle are flatter and there's a muscle design cattle that are heavier muscle are going to have some more shape and dimension to them similar to a, a bodybuilder and so you can see when we're evaluate muscle in cattle as we look at them <clears throat> base width is so important um, you know cattle that that have some muscle are typically going to stand wider apart and they're going to walk with a wider base to them as as well and it's going to transition all the way up we look at for me as I'm looking at muscle and the width of cattle pin width is extremely important as well as how wide they are across their hooks if I'm selecting replacement females uh, I look look at structure down here and then I'm going to come up here and look up here because I like I do not like cattle that are real narrow pinned uh, because what comes out of between those pins the calf all right and so I, I really call heavily on on real narrow pin kind of a cattle uh, but if you look at this this particular steer you can see he's wide here 
He's wide in his round, but he's also wide as we get him into his lower quarter, uh, as well as his twist as well. So he's real square from behind. Um, same thing from the side. We can see the shape in that particular animal, shape in the forearm uh, of him as well. <clears throat> we can also look down the top of these cattle. And, and again, <clears throat> fat will mask uh, or make cattle look like they're thicker than they are. But cattle that, that, that have some muscling to them, you're oftentimes going to see, instead of just a big, flat, wide back, you're going to see some natural shape to that muscling. Natural shape out of their hip, natural shape into their rib here, all the way up into their shoulder as well with that. And this steer is really heavily muscled. He almost has a groove down him. The other thing that you'll notice about cattle that, that have some shape uh, and are mus that have some muscling to them, are they going to be flat in their rib design? If you get a cat, uh, an animal that's got some muscling up down its top, they're typically going to have some spring of rib. And you think about it, that rib's coming out of that, that loin there, and those cattle that have some muscle shape are also going to come out and they're going to have some spring and shape of rib as well as we study them. So again, all these pieces begin to work together uh, with that. And so again, here's two different steers. <clears throat> We're looking at muscle. Um, and this translates, if you know, just think about feeder cattle. All right, these two steers, I know these are two halter show steers, uh, but it, it, you know, if we think of them as calves, uh, they're going to look the same way as just as a calf. Now we can utilize a growth implant and we can put fat on them, but still muscle is muscle in these cattle. And you can see this Hereford on the left, uh, he looks like a V from behind. He's narrow in his base, doesn't have a lot of muscle there in his uh, lower quarter and twist. Uh, got some width up top. Top, but there's a lot of fat up top too. Whereas the calf on the right, if you study him from behind, he's very square uh, in his muscle pattern. Same thing down their top. You can see this Hereford on the left, the water's going to run off. But if you study him and look at him out of his rib too, he's going to be a little bit flatter in his rib design on top of it. Here's a, uh, a couple of Charlotte bulls, and, and <clears throat> as you study them, when I'm looking at muscle, yeah, you can go around behind them and look at them, but really and truly, if you want to see how heavy muscled cattle are, if you'll look at them from the front end and, and from kind of a, a, a third view there, um, because if you see cattle that you can see some shape out of their round and quarter from the front, they're probably going to have some muscling to them. All right, if you see that shape coming out of that lower quarter, and, and for me, that's what I like to look at. And you can see these two Charlet bulls here. The one on the, the back end there, he's a lot squarer in his hip. He's a little wider based. He's got more, uh, more uh, shape in his round, whereas the run in, one in front is, looks more like a V in his design. Also looking at, again, rib shape. See how that rib's coming out of the, the one in behind? He's a bigger topped versus the one that's a little bit flatter in his rib design. Again, all these pieces of the puzzle start to work. Um, when, we, when we imported the continental breeds, we imported them because of their heavy muscle and leanness. Those two go together. As you begin to put too much muscling in them, uh, you can reduce some fleshing ability and marbling ability in those cattle. Again, what are we hanging our hat on in the Beefmaster breed? Cattle that do well, that are easy doing, females, uh, and, and I think that's important. So, but at the same time, can we put some muscle in them? Yeah, I think you see that as a breed, what you guys have done. Uh, but you got to be careful with that. You know, too much muscling, you can get in, uh, increased incidence of dystocia. Uh, on an extreme example, you can get some smaller pelvic area. Um, you know, prime example was some of these continental breeds when they first came in. Uh, and then even some of these double muscle breeds like the Piedmontese or Belgian Blue. Uh, I can remember in seeing those when they were first imported uh, at the Houston Livestock Show, I was little, and uh, just looking at the, the pin width and the vulvas uh, on those things, I was a smart aleck when I was a kid. Maybe I'm a smart aleck now, but uh, I asked one of those breeders, I said, how does that calf come out of that? And, and they, they said, oh, we do C-sections on most of them, okay? 
practicality, not very practical. That's not why they're that's why they're not around. So, and incapacity. Uh, again, there's an old full blood canine on the left. The bull on the right's a, a Simbral that I took up in northeast Texas. But uh, you know, depth of body is important uh, to these cattle. Again, where is the factory of a cow? The middle. The factory is the forage processing plant. We got to realize that, that we're in the business of growing grass and those guys harvest it. And uh, the grass that we grow a lot of times in the south may not be the highest quality grass. So the more grass they can eat, the more they can process and the more nutrients they can get out of it. And that's when we're looking at depth of body in these cattle. And you can see those two examples. Uh, that, cat, that bull on the right has got a lot of, is deep bodied, but he's got a lot of shape to his rear as well uh, with that versus the one on the right uh, you know what we used to term the, the hard doing kind of a cattle so depth of body is important but also shape of rib uh, to go along with it as well so those are important things to, to think about balance and eye bill uh, you know how the piece is put together and the reality is uh, you know you can have all the data in the world on these cattle but you got to sell them at the end of the day, all right? And uh, as, you know, just, you know, the bull sale, the, 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 the sale that you're going to have tomorrow at four, um, you know, the date is important, but, but they got to have all the pieces put together. Uh, and I think it's always important. And you can have both and they can go hand in hand. There is no doubt about it. Um, that, that you can produce cattle that with functionality, that have some balance and eye appeal like this Red Bull here, and uh, you know, put the pieces together for your customers, whether it be another seed stock producer or a commercial producer that's buying bulls. Uh, because if I'm buying a bull, I sure don't want a sorry bull out there in the pasture because somebody's going to make fun of me. Okay, And so you can put it in the balance and eye appeal. And when we're talking about balance and eye appeal, we're talking about how the if we divide this bull into to really three pieces, we, we take the middle out of him, and that first third ought to be similar length to the middle third to the hind third. Uh, levelness in that chest floor. He's got, uh, you know, he's a mature bull, so he's got a little bit of chest to him, but he still balances into his underline as well. If we look at him out of his hip design, he's pretty level in his hip. Again, he's not perfectly level. There's his hook bones and his pin bones, but that's desirable there. Uh, at the same time, we look at his shoulder design, and he's not excessively coarse in his shoulder design and open in the shoulder design. We definitely don't want that from a calving ease uh, perspective. Um, so again, you, you've got to put all these pieces of the puzzle together in one complete uh, package for these cattle. Uh, masculinity or femininity? A cow ought to look like a cow and a bull ought to look like a bull. And if you've got a set of cows and you can't determine which one's your bull and which one's your cows, you either got a feminine bull or a bunch of masculine cows, one of the two. And I mean, I don't even have to show you the reproductive organs on these two uh, yearling animals, and you can see the one on the right, that's a bull, all right? He's a broader-headed animal. His eye socket's a little bit more pronounced. If I could see his neck, he's going to have the, the, a little bit of a crest there from the testosterone. Uh, again, we want that masculinity in these cattle. Uh, you know, I, and, and at the same time, femininity. I had somebody tell me, I heard this story one time, said, you, you know, you, if I'm getting a bull to produce heifers, I don't want a, a, a you know, a, a, a manly, masculine looking bull. I want one that's, that uh, is look like he's going to produce some heifers, okay? If that's the case, all right, and the way genetics work, uh, I would have never married my wife because my father-in-law is a burly-looking guy, okay? And you think about that. Same thing in cattle. Uh, good, stout, masculine bulls, they'll raise good, stout, uh, good females for you as well. So don't think about that concept that i, I got to have a heifer raising bull. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, so, again, masculinity is important, but also femininity, and you you can see uh, this, the female that's on the left, you can see her eye is a little more feminine. She's a little narrower in her head. Her jaw 
is not as pronounced as well. And if we study her through her shoulder design and neck design, her neck's going to be thinner and her shoulder's going to be flatter. So again, those are things that, uh, whether it be masculinity or femininity, you've got to look at. If you're retaining ownership, again, Lance is going to talk to you about the data and the EPDs. Um, you know, if you're retaining ownership or you're selling into a program, you've got to look at the carcass. And I think that in this particular breed, you've you got to look at the carcass data and begin managing it. Again, I don't think you hang your hat on the carcass data and just charge on and just think about carcass data and nothing else because you are a maternal breed uh, and keep that in mind. So uh, think about those things. So let's see. Again, maternal versus terminal, that, that's the balance you guys have got to make uh, within this uh, particular breed as well. Uh, temperament, that's something that's also from a visual selection I think is important. Um, you know, I think it's important from, from a management, a, a producers that you're selling these cattle to. Um, you know, if you're selling a set of bulls to a ranch that's extensive in South Texas, they're gathering them by helicopters, maybe temperament is not as big of a deal. But in reality, uh, uh, those crazy cattle that come out of those scenarios, are they going to be, are they gonna, they're straightening out period in the feed yard and everything else, it's going to be a little longer for them. And at the end, they're not going to be as efficient. Uh, and we've got some data on some exit velocity and different things that we've done there at Overton, uh, the Overton Research Center as well as Texas A&M that prove some of those thoughts. Uh, and so again, I think you've got to really look at temperament in these cattle just from a management but also a production standpoint as well. So utilize the tools that you have. Uh, it's extremely important. Um, you know, use the data. The visual selection is important with that. Uh, I think you got to be careful. Avoid the single trait selection. Sometimes we start chasing a rabbit in the cattle business, and then the next thing you know, we're, we're in a mess. And, and uh, you've seen that time and time again. Um, you know, and the last thing I always say is, uh, and today's business, cattle with some backgrounders, there's more value to them. And when I say background to them, I'm talking about data on those cattle, the health of those cattle, and uh, the honesty of the people producing them too. And if you want to be long-lived in the seed stock business, integrity and honesty is extremely important with it. And so uh, think about those things. I'm going to show you a few pictures of some challenges. Now, I did not use beef masters in these videos that I pulled off the, of some sales because y'all don't have these problems. So, you know, we, we picked on Brangus here. Oh, wait a minute. Go back. I get it to play. What's the challenge with that bull? Look at his shoulder there, his front shoulder design. Okay, and look at his front knee. Okay, uh, that particular bull one, he's just not very balanced at all. Uh, he's not very heavy muscled, but as you look at him out of his shoulder, he's really straight out of his shoulder there. And, um, and you can see in his movement, see his, old sp his uh, back and his spine is kind of humped up. He's got some challenges there. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, it's got a little bit of a pop to his pastern on that back left one. See that? Again, uh, you know, some of those things like that we see in these cattle is they get nervous. Sometimes they'll do that. Um, but that's a big red flag when you see, you know, see him popping in that, that uh, pastern. And he was actually popping in his hawk pretty significantly there. This guy's got uh, several different things going on with him. One is sheath design is a challenge. And two, he's just not very heavy muscled. And, he, and, and he's really deep in, in his chest floor. He's got more front end than he's got back end uh, on him. So he's probably a little lighter muscled and, and really pendulous sheath. Uh, again, that's something we didn't talk about, but that's, that's an important characteristic you've got to look at.
This one I think has a bad hawk on him. This one's moving pretty good. Um, maybe a little shorter strided. There's one in here. Oh, this one here. What's wrong with that guy? Yeah, look at his front left knee. Again, he, he was probably, hopefully he was cold out of that sail because of that. Yeah, look at him. This this bull is pretty wide uh, out of his shoulder and maybe just a little straight out of his front end. Uh, and he's some challenges. You can see he's really on his back. He's kind of humped up. Um, and it just looks like, you know, he's having trouble moving. You know, he's not limping, but he's just, you know, it, it it's kind of uh, takes a lot of effort to get out and move. And, and those are things that you that you got to look for in that. Um, there's my contact information. Um, I, and, and I also invite you, uh, one of my jobs at A&M is I coordinate the Texas A&M Beef Cattle Short Course. And um, you guys through the American Breeds Coalition has been a long-term supporter uh, of the program. And we appreciate that. Last year we had about 2,300 folks. And I know some of you attend the program. Um, uh, BBU has a booth there year after year because we've got a huge trade show. And we invite you to attend that if you just go to beef.tamu.edu or beef cattle short course um, you can find it or, or look us up on Facebook as well um, but with that I think we got a little bit of time for questions Colin or comments I'll take that as well not at all yes sir <clears throat> Yeah, very good question, and and I don't know, probably eight or ten years ago, when when y'all had that the meeting down in a river bottom, in the middle of nowhere, um, I was afraid I'd never make it out. Uh, but uh, that was one of the things we mentioned uh, in that meeting is is the breed moves forward. I think uh, the breed needed to tighten the hide up some, um, just from a marketability and feeder cattle standpoint, because regardless, you know, if, if you're selling cow calves based off of visual, which uh, a little less than 50% of all the calves marketed in the U.S. are marketed through a sale barn, and, um, you know, they could be quarter Brahmin and fit the mix in the southern U.S. on the calves, but if they look like they're closer to half, they're going to get treated as a half. And I think that's what you have to be careful with. And, and I think the beef master probably had just a little too much hide. And, you know, when the hide's kind of hanging off the feet and legs. Uh, now, has the breed done a lot to improve that? Absolutely. But at the same time, I think you have to be careful as a breed as a whole, all right, that you don't want to get the breed to look more boss taurus than it does boss indicus. And when you breed all the hide off of them, yes, they're getting more boss taurus. Now, do I think that there can be both ends of the spectrum? Absolutely, because we've got breeders out there now that, that have kind of gone on the Angus route and they bred the Brahmin influence out of them. So they need cattle, beef master cattle, or whatever it may be, that probably have look closer to that half uh, blood Brahmin influence because they're going to plug that in. Now, there are some in there that may be running, have a set of commercial cows that look closer to half already. Well, then they may need some cleaner type cattle. So I think you can have both ends of the spectrum, but I think in all, I think the breed's done a real good job taking some of the hide off, but don't, don't get too far on the other side of the spectrum because you will lose some adaptability with it, certainly. Good, good point. Yes, sir. Yeah, 
Not necessarily when you think about just actual confirmation. Now, we do, you know, have some genetic defects that have popped up in, in several of the breeds, um, like the TH or the PH and different things, which will give you some skeletal abnormalities. But uh, not that I'm aware of if, if there's been anything from a DNA typing to look at those cattle. Because uh, really... Their, 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 their bones are, their structure, I shouldn't say their structure, the, the bones are normal, it's just the angles are off in, in their design. So, somebody else had another question. Like, when we do a 100 bull test, and, you, and you've got the sires in the lower 90 percentile EPD on, let's say, uh, IMF, mm -hmm. we get this calf with 120 on IMF. Yeah. What, what are his calves? Are they going to lean more towards what his sire was, or are they going to get or are they going to go more towards his Yeah, so good good question on that. Uh, and when we think about individual performance versus the EPDs, again, that that's expected progeny differences, all right? And so we're looking at and trying to predict a breeding value. Uh, and that would be if we bred this particular sire to 30 cows of similar type, on average, this is what they would be. Now, will you have some of those extremes? Certainly. Now, will his data be affected by those extremes? Certainly. I mean, if he's genetically got more marbling, uh, he's going to be one. His EPD should reflect some of that. And you'll really be able to tell is as you get some additional progeny on the ground, or if you actually collected some carcass data on it. Okay? Others. Trey? Moving forward, what do you think our biggest structural challenge of the breed? I think um, in the beef, you always want to put me on the spot, don't you? Uh, you know, the, some of the things that I see in beef master cattle, um, probably, and, and again, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the lesser of two evils, uh, but you, I still see some beef master cattle that are probably a little weaker pastern than our deal, and they're a little shorter on their heels, all right? And, and, and that's probably what I see more than anything. Now, don't correct it on the flip side and start breeding, breeding a bunch of straight cattle, because I'd rather have that lesser evil than the straight one. But that's, that's what I would see uh, from, a, from a beef master uh, perspective is, you know, you know, sometimes you get a weaker pastern uh, off of those hind legs, and then you get a shorter heel. Uh, and again, you, you know, that, that defect is, mag is magnified. But think about a structural defect, something little like that. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, and, and he, he's, he's, he was a mentor of mine, but he's a bigger guy, all right? And somehow he cut his little toe off cutting grass with a push mower. Now, I have no idea how this happened, all right? But because he limped around for a period of time and favoring that foot, then he began to have hip and knee problems, all right, and so any little defect, you know, as, as slight as maybe a weaker pastern and shorter f foot, over time you're going to see the claws grow, and you're going to see some problems with that. And even over time, those cattle that that are weaker pastern, maybe a little sicker hocked, as they mature, I judged a breed at Houston. I don't know how I got got into this deal, but it was a specialty breed per se and that specialty breed showed them from birth to about 15 years old all right and they all got to come back for the champion drive and I wish I would have taken a picture of them because that breed was known to be more sickle hocked in their design and weaker in their pasterns and when you saw the young ones out there they really they they're, they didn't um, round off in their pins, uh, and they were pretty level from their sh point of their shoulders to their hip. But as those things got older, I mean, it's like they became a ramp, all right, because their hind end was breaking down uh, on them, and they were getting weaker in their pasterns, their heels were grinding off, and it looked like they were just running uphill. And it was amazing how the magnitude of those cattle as they got older with that. So, again, that's, that's again, my, my thought on that, so... Okay, Colin, I'll 
turn it over to you unless anybody else has any questions. And I'll be around in a little while today, so thank you guys.